Welcome to the Genealogy Gems Podcast, providing quick and innovative ways to make the absolute most out of your research time and creative ideas for sharing and displaying your family history. I'm your host, Lisa Louise Cook. Well, as you know, in episode 89 of the Genealogy Gems podcast, we had part one of my conversation with Dr. Robert Leonard, PhD. He's a forensic linguist at Hofstra University, and he shared with us some pretty riveting stories about how they have used forensic linguistics to help in crime cases. He talked about the Hummert case that was featured on Forensic Files and also the one about the Devil's Strip. Wasn't that interesting? Well, be sure and check out the show notes for this episode, which is number 90, because I'm going to have a link to where you can go watch a four minute clip of Dr. Leonard talking more about those cases. And of course, to get to the show notes, go to genealogygems.com, click on podcast in the far left hand corner and navigate your way to episode number 90. In today's episode, as I mentioned at the top of the show, he's going to now bring his forensic linguistics and the work that he's done in the crime cases and explain how we might be able to take some of those principles and tools and use them on our own genealogical documents. Here's part two of my conversation with Dr. Robert Leonard. When I saw you on Forensic Files and I heard you talking about this incredible way that you had of looking at these handwritten letters, my mind immediately jumped to the letters, the documents, diaries, all the things that we have from our ancestors as researchers. And I couldn't help but wonder if there might be situations where a person who has an old document from an ancestor, you know, might be able to find clues about that ancestor's life by incorporating some of these same techniques that you're talking about in your work. So for instance, you know, could forensic linguistics provide a lead as to where an ancestor might have lived or been raised or maybe provide insight into their education level um, or other aspects? Or I was even thinking as you were talking, we might have one document that's identified and one that we don't know who the writer is, as we often have photographs when we don't know who the people are or when it was taken. What are your thoughts on that? Would we be able to potentially kind of incorporate some of these things that you're talking about? Yeah, I, I thought it was an excellent thought on your part uh, when when you made the connection, the potential connection between genealogy and uh, which is detective work. If if there's anything on this planet that's detective work, it's that. <laughs> yeah. And um, you use the uh, you know if you could do um, an analysis of enough written material. You could come up, sometimes you don't even need a lot, but sometimes you'd need uh, quite a bit. It, uh, unfortunately, the data doesn't cooperate. Sometimes it will present you something. It's like, it's like looking for shells on the beach. Some day you go there and there's 20 of them, and other days uh, there's just nothing. Uh, but then that next wave brings you something. Um, for example, if one of your uh, ancestors uh, used the term devil strip for that, that would be pretty good evidence that uh, perhaps they had gone through Akron. Or, of course, depending on the time scale, um, it might mean something totally different. For example, I suspect that Devil Strip means Devil Strip uh, in Akron. From an old railroading term, imagine a train taking a turn on the track, and you are standing right next to the track, on the outside of the turn. Mm-hmm. At some point, that train is going to swing around and a piece of it is going to stick out and hit you. Right. See? Because it doesn't sinuously follow that uh, curve, but parts of it sticks out. That w- area, if there's a walkway next to um, a uh, train track, that a piece of a train is going to stick into at one point, that's known as the devil something or other. And I think that's probably where they got it from in Akron because the devil strip, you can't park on it. Um, uh, Maybe if a car gets too close, hmm, I don't know now. It it made more sense to me. I think because it looks like it's useful for something, but it actually isn't. 
Yeah, exactly. And, and, and it's sort of like a path that simply isn't going to work. Well, in any event, you never know if you find something like that, whether you're finding the origins of the, uh, let's say, the Akron Devil Strip or, or the Akron Devil Strip. So you have to be careful, but at least it can point you in the right direction. Um, Kathy Reichs is a forensic anthropologist and uh, a wonderful uh, lady and a great author and a really good forensic anthropologist. And her uh, novels, uh, she, she's been a forensic anthropologist for a long time, and then one day she decided to write a detective novel, and she did. I think it was called Deja Dead. And um, eventually television picked up all of her books to make the Bones TV show. It's a very popular TV oh, show, right. and that's based on her, or it's based on her alter ego in the book or something like that. I've never figured it out. Uh-huh. But... Um, one day she called me up, and I had no idea who she was, and she said, uh, could you give me uh, a hand writing a uh, forensic linguist into a detective novel? And I said, well, uh, I don't know. Sure, why not? So we wrote together that part where my character helps her character solve the mystery of where her friend she, well, I don't want to spoil the plot because it's <laughs> all, and it's called um, Bones to Ashes. Uh-huh. But she's trying to trace an old friend, and we have these uh, poems. And from characteristics of the poems, my character says, oh, well, the person knew French, but look at the kind of French the person knew. It was uh, Canadian French, and I can yeah. tell because of X, Y, and Z. But that's very odd. This person was Canadian French, but the person lived in South Carolina at some point because even in her French she refers to something the way that South Carolinian Gullah speakers do. <laughs> See, So that's why I thought of that immediately when you brought up the genealogy because you can actually you carry traces of every place you've ever lived in your speech. They might not surface all the time but then at the oddest times they will. Now, see, that to me is so exciting. The idea that, like you say, there's little pieces of our life experiences built into how we write, how we talk, and that's got to be the same for our ancestors. So, right now, wait, let, let, me, let me just uh, uh-huh. interrupt you for a moment. The other really interesting piece about this, you and I were talking about just a few minutes ago, which is that being educated people, we are trained to ignore that which doesn't make sense. Mm-hmm. Whereas now, we can find that that which doesn't make sense could be the keys that we're looking for. Ah. So, for example, if you find in the speech of, uh, in, in the letter, that um, I went out on the lanai and I did X, Y, and Z, well, you would probably just ignore it or think it was a misprint because what's a lanai? But lanai is the Hawaiian, normal Hawaiian word for a balcony mm-hmm. or, or a uh, porch. And maybe the person had been a seafarer and been in Hawaii. You see what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. Something that you would ignore on purpose because it just didn't make any sense. Now you can say, gee, maybe this is some idiosyncrasy that will tell us where the person was. Go ahead, though. Sorry to interrupt. No, that's okay. I can just hear all of the genealogists out there listening, um, rattling through and grabbing their pages to take a second look. Because chances are we may have overlooked some of these things, like you say. Now... Of course, I had to selfishly send you a couple of diary pages because I have volumes of diaries from my grandmother. And that's what I was thinking about when you were talking about the Unabomber. There was a case where you probably had the luxury of having an awful lot of written material to work with, right? And being able to connect those up. In my case, I I certainly have years and years of these diaries. So I just kind of randomly copied a couple of pages and sent them out to you. And it was really interesting. Um, I'll post these for everybody listening on the show notes. But you spotted the one thing that caught my eye, too, because it didn't make sense or it didn't sound normal to me. Remember, you wrote me about the finger wave. That's right. Yeah, she she, your grandmother wrote about uh, going in for a finger curl or something like that. And I know from my own grandmother, who was very proud of being one of the first women in New York to have her hair bobbed, just like Fred Astaire's sister. <laughs> yeah, she told me she went into a man's barbershop. You know, this is in the 20s. Oh, wow. Or, or teens, for all I know. And oh. um, demanded that uh, the guy cut her hair, and he did. See? So uh, I know Finger Curl from her. And 
finger curl would place this probably sometime around the 30s, and, and I saw that uh, you did know when it was written, which is the 30s. And it's yeah. that kind of thing. Yeah. Sure. Well, and that's interesting because chances are, like you say, we have read through the various documents that we have, and we just kind of moved through those and probably digested them in a way that we thought made sense, how they might fit in context. But we could go back, and I'm guessing you probably even do this too, when you find a term or a phrase or something that, that you're not familiar with that's, that is one of the ones that jumps out on you, you could probably just go online and do a quick search to try to find the origins. What, what resources do you use to try to learn more about those phrases that you don't recognize? Well, it's very difficult to, you know, uh, the, the uh, Internet is a double-edged sword. Yeah. <laughs> There's a lot of information out there, and nine, 99% of it is wrong. Mm-hmm. which is the problem. Um, but before I get into that, let me just go back to something uh, you mentioned about the Unabomber. Yeah. Um, I never worked on the Unabomber, but my very, very good friend, Jim Fitzgerald, uh, who just retired as the chief of forensic linguistic services for the FBI um, and now works for an excellent uh, group called uh, Academy Group International, he was uh, assigned to uh, the Unabomber case, and one of the things that he noticed was a phrase, instead of you can have your cake and eat it too, mm -hmm. Kaczynski used the phrase, you can't eat your cake and have it too. Oh. It's a reversal, right? And right. the first several times he read this, he, he didn't, you know, we just knew there was something wrong, and then he seized <laughs> on it. And it was in the manifesto, and it was in Kaczynski's writings, you see. This was a link that one of the things that uh, he used to prove that Kaczynski was the person who wrote the manifesto, and uh, they were able to show uh, that it was justified going into his cabin in, uh, in the woods. But very often we read something, and we know there's something a little bit odd about it, but of course we just put it out of our mind. Now you might want to write it down or, or look it up. But the, the interesting thing always in science is not the single item but it is the series of items, a, a wave of items, a, um, a pattern. So uh -huh. that's why it's good to write these things down, because one or two or ten by themselves may not tell the story, but then you put that 11th together and it's like a little jigsaw puzzle. So, for example, Lanai, I mean, I don't know why I settled upon that, but I was in Hawaii several times and uh, I was always struck by the quote-unquote normal English that people spoke, except all of a sudden everybody would say, are you pow, which means are you finished? <laughs> uh, oh. Is it pow hana yet, or is work done? Or please, kokua, please help. Or uh, let's go out on the lanai and, uh, you know, have, uh, have some lemonade. Um, and this is just so part and parcel of their speech that um, people don't, they're not really aware it's not quote-unquote normal English. So let's say you had Lanai, and then you might piece together something else, Californian, uh, from uh, an earlier period. And, and as you write all these down, you might be able to figure out uh, a passage of someone just from the words that they picked up. I know uh, I lived in East Africa for eight years, and okay. uh, matter of fact, I met my wife, who's from New Hampshire there, and we used certain wow. words because we lived in East Africa for so long, we'll probably never use other words uh, for, uh, for various items. And my children grew up using these words, and they never had any idea that they were using Swahili uh, words. Oh, how funny. See? So um, those journeys of my wife's and mine are embedded in our language and even in our children. But that's a really interesting point. We could be um, reading a probate record or a, a journal or whatever, we might actually be looking at the influence of the generation behind the person writing it, is what you're saying. Exactly. exactly. Ah. See, and I bring that up because these are caveats. It's very, very easy if you're not, if you haven't been trained in something for 35 years to think you've yeah. found the key. And indeed, very many times people do, but many times they've just found the beginning of the key. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Where to get information, um, I would always say the Oxford English Dictionary, or in general, one of the things I do when I'm using, uh, when I just am going online to find some information, is I limit the search, which you can do very easily on Google, et cetera, to .edu uh, websites, 
uh, .edu websites are at least uh, universities and colleges. And that doesn't mean that they're right, and it could just be somebody's notes or a student paper, but usually it's something put out by uh, a professor or the university. And again, they can be wrong, of course. I mean, scientists are always disagreeing. But at least you know they're not putting it there so they can pick your pocket or uh, get yeah. you onto their gambling website. You see what I'm saying? <laughs> exactly. Or, or just in some normal rant to make money. Yeah. So just that's what I like, .edu. Uh, at your public library, I'm sure you can use the vast resources of the Oxford English Dictionary online. The Oxford English Dictionary has compiled just about every word in the English language and gives you examples of its history dated and with citations of where it is from. And um, libraries will have subscriptions to that. I mean, you can get your own, too. Oh, okay. Oh, excellent. So you go to the public library and say, gee, uh, is there, do you have access to the Oxford English Dictionary through your website? Can I use one of your computers? And, of course, the other place you always find good information is going to your reference librarian and your public library. Yes. Because that's what they are trained to do. And uh, there are databases and websites that every time I go into my university library at Hofstra University on Long Island, we have a great, enormous university. I learn something every single time I go in there and I talk to the reference librarians. And, of course, they adore being asked questions yeah. because <laughs> that's what they've been trained to do. And it's easy to forget that, but they are there and they're invaluable. They, they hear it and see it every day. Also, I always tell my students that while you might think you're doing them a favor, not trying to nail them down, give them as specific a question as possible. For example, if you're going to write a, a paper, I tell them on, you know, Quebec, don't walk in and say, I, I need information on Canada. You yeah. say, I need information on Quebec, specifically X, Y, and Z, because it might be a whole different kind of database that they can then direct you to. And sometimes, don't, don't they often, you know, they hear your question, and, and they actually know of another direction to go that you haven't thought of. The more specific you tell them, the more they can identify that. Exactly. Great yeah, you, idea. You put that perfectly. That's what, I, that's what I was trying to say just now. You, 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 that's, that's it in a nutshell. Yeah. And you mentioned that, that you can search the .edu. I know that there's also Google Scholar, and I'll have a link um, to that for you guys in the show notes, because Google Scholar, is, again, is another way to get to the scholarly type of research. So at least you're uh, upping your chances, right, of <laughs> finding good data. True. That's very true. As a matter of fact, when we construct databases to uh, see how rare or common something that somebody is using in their language, um, we'll go to Google Scholar because it's a very rarefied bunch of writings, and um, uh, we know that uh, it's a very limiting um, uh, universe of writings because it is uh, all scholarly. It's a great uh, resource. It's a good idea. Mm -hmm. Now, you were talking a few minutes ago about looking at that wave of information, that series of information, and yet you've also been talking about what sounds like getting the magnifying glass out and getting up real close and looking at some of those, if you have to go word by word, to make sure that you're digesting everything that you're reading in a particular document. So it sounds like there's kind of the micro side of things and the macro side of things. When somebody first comes to you, if the FBI comes to you and hands you a document, how do you approach it? What are you doing first? Are you looking with the magnifying glass or are you first kind of getting an overview of the series of whatever information they have available? Well, it really depends on what it is uh, that we're supposed to be looking for. Um, the type of case that we're talking about here is uh, called authorship. Um, you know, who wrote it uh, or what uh, are the demographics of that person. There are many other applications of uh, forensic linguistics, for example, what might the, the meaning of the words in this contract be, or uh, very often we get uh, undercover tapes of um, apparent criminal activity, and we're asked, is this sufficient to charge someone with conspiracy uh, to... Um, solicitation to murder or something like that, and uh, or as this person attempted to bribe. So sometimes what we're asked to do is to look at the underlying structure and look at the words and see was the communicative intent of a, of a conversation 
an attempt to bribe or was it not? Okay, so that that's a whole other area of forensic linguistics that has less application here, although sometimes it would be interesting to see what the purpose of various documents that we find in uh, the attic uh, were. Mm -hmm. Specifically, um, I have a, a whole list of things that I use when I train agents or students or whoever. One of the first things I say is just look at the document, read it over. If you're a native English speaker, you have a very good innate sense. Was this written by an English speaker? Yeah. Are you saying? Yeah. Read it a few times. Then it just, it, in geology, not genealogy, I think geologists, they say they go up to a, a rock face and, and there's all these different layers that are from different uh, periods of time, uh, earth time, and they, they get up close to it and they just schmooze it. They, they, they just get to know the, the rocks and get to see where the styrations are. And that's what we do with the documents. We read it through, uh, look at the different words, um, see if you think it's a native English speaker. Look at the patterns, look at the rhythms. Now, sometimes, though, if it's a, a sufficiently different dialect, you might think that the person isn't a native speaker of English. I mean, um, if another great place just for amusement uh, and, and edification is going on a website called BBC, you know, British Broadcasting Corporation, mm -hmm. BBC Voices. They have recordings of people from all over, from every dialect in England. And it is astounding to Americans, myself included, how little we can understand some <laughs> of the British dialects, yet, yet they're English, you see. Yeah. Right. So um, that aside, uh, we schmooze it. We, we try to see whether the person is a native English speaker. Then we start looking at sentence patterns. We look at grammar. We look at punctuation. Um, we, we look at specific words. Uh, sometimes we are trying to prove authorship and, and uh, we're, we're asked to see if there's evidence that person A or person B wrote a document. And very often you'll find words that show expertise in a particular field. Mm. And then that can very easily tilt you one way or the other. Odd ways of saying things that you find replicated in uh, just going back to what I'm doing, not necessarily the genealogy now, mm -hmm. that's the best. When we find patterns, a string of things that are odd, that are idiosyncratic, and that are also replicated in the uh, subject's writings, that's, we're getting closer to having an idea that perhaps the best hypothesis is that that person wrote it. But there's always a danger, and the danger is, I'll give you an example. Now, mm -hmm. where are you from originally? Well, I was born in Northern California, but I was raised in Washington State. I live in California now. Right. Okay. Now, when you go into the supermarket and uh, there's a bunch of people waiting, where do you stand to wait to pay? Uh, in line? Right. Now, in New York, we stand online. Oh, really? <laughs> I haven't heard so that. So imagine, imagine there's a murder in California. Uh-huh. And we see some document written by the murderer and says, I was standing online and I saw her and she was so beautiful I had to kill her. And then they pick up the suspect and sure enough, in his writings, he uses this very weird online. Now, nobody says online, so it must be him, right? Just like uh, the funny uh, way of contracting. Yeah. But all we've really done is narrow the suspect pool to the 9 million people who live in New York <laughs> City. See? Yeah, yeah, you have to be careful not to let it uh, send you down a rabbit hole. That's right. What's idiosyncratic to you or me may not actually be idiosyncratic. It might simply be something that we're not familiar with. So you just see why there's so much research always involved before we make an opinion. Oh, absolutely. And I think, you know, obviously we can't replicate as genealogists, you know, your 30 years of experience, but it's so fascinating just to listen to what you're talking about, and, and you start kind of thinking outside the box. Um, that's why I love, you know, doing this kind of interview, because it just kind of shakes things up a little bit. It's real easy to get in this kind of monotone of how you approach your research. And you are really waking us up to some different ideas. You know, you mentioned the BBC Voices. 
sounds very cool. Well, I'll, I'll have to look that up. I'll get a link for that in the show notes. But I believe um, I have seen on the Library of Congress, I think it's the American Memory Project, they have a lot of recordings that they have done of people across the around the United States as well. So that could be a way to, if you know you're looking in a certain area, maybe get familiar with their, their backgrounds and their talking. But it's interesting. You know, when I first saw your your segment on television and I got thinking and I was looking through your website, I was strictly thinking documents. But you were just talking about reviewing like the transcripts of an interrogation or like you say, some, somebody might be bribing somebody. And it, it's interesting because I think it was last year, I tracked down a cousin and she came over to my house and brought a big tattered old 50 year old box. And inside of it was an old reel to reel tape recording. And it had um, audio of some of my husband's ancestors on it, you know, his grandparents. And there were a couple of other people we were trying to identify who they were. And I, I thought, as, as I was listening to you s- to talk, really, we're not limited just to that. But we could also, if we have any kind of recordings, we could transcribe those perhaps and then look at them that way as well. Absolutely. Or have people who are trained in dialect listen yeah. to them. Yeah, 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 very true. And, of course, I learned something, and I have to hand it to you, because just three weeks ago, my wife was reading to my children and myself um, her grandmother's uh, autobiography that she wrote just before she died because she oh. wanted to pass this on to my wife. Yeah. It never occurred to me for a moment to do the kinds of things <laughs> that I'm suggesting. Oh. <laughs> I was just Isn't listening true? to it. Right, in your own backyard. That's right, exactly. So. Well, see, now you owe it to her. You're going to have to go back and, and take a look at it. In fact, a, a gal that who's a genealogy blogger that I interviewed a while back, she told me about a terrific transcription software. And I was thinking about it in terms of audio. You could type up what you're hearing, but also it has a section above it where you could also make some notes. And as you were talking about, as you're listening, as you're reading you want to be making note and identifying those things that are standing out to you. You know, we're so used to just looking at document by document. But I, as you were talking, I could just see you with, you know, kind of laying out all the various documents across the table and looking at that big picture. And that probably isn't an approach we take very often. We tend to just pull out the one document at a time. But really, it's that global view. I, I love that idea. Now, there might be a few people out there who've been listening to your voice. You have a a wonderful radio voice. And, you know, thinking, hmm, I I wonder if I've ever heard that voice before. Now, tell everyone, where might they have heard the voice of Dr. Leonard before? Um, Oh, you mean Shanana? Yeah. (laughs) Shanana. I see. (laughs) Well, when I was in college, I went to Columbia College, and I was the head of a, a small singing group. And one day we sang some 1950 songs, although it was almost 1970, and everybody loved them. And my brother, who was uh, my much older brother, he was old, 23, he <laughs> was a graduate student, and he said, you know what, I have an idea. Why don't we put on a, an act where we will recreate the 50s, and, and let's call it the glory that was Greece. The glory that was Greece, the grandeur that was Rome, if you ever read that in, yeah. uh, in, in school, right? And we ha- were originally the Kingsmen, but there was another group called the Kingsmen, and we changed our name finally to Shanana. <laughs> and around, uh, my brother said to me, call the boys to your apartment. And I called the 10, 11 guys from the group, and uh, he said, boys, I'm going to make you rock and roll stars. Oh, and we all said, yeah, yeah, sure, that's right, yeah. you will. And five months later, I was sitting in the most insider's nightclub in New York City, and Jimi Hendrix was teaching me how to drink tequila shot. Oh, man. (laughs) Uh, He got us booked to Woodstock, and we went on, and I sang at Woodstock right before Jimi. Wow. The career, while, while we're in college, mind you. Oh, that's amazing. Oh, how funny. Pretty amazing, too. Uh, matter of fact, it was, it was like a, a dream. Yeah. 
just an absolute dream. The night that in this little nightclub, uh, that night with Jimi Hendrix, I look up and at the end of my song, I sang death songs, Teen Angel, Tell Laura I Love Her. There's Jimi Hendrix, not 10 feet away from me, jumping up and down on a chair, clapping. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. I mean, I said, well, Lord, take me now. Yeah. No better thing that can ever happen to me in my <laughs> life. Um, and uh, so... Died and gone to heaven. Eventually, I said, uh, guys, I've had a great time. Uh, it's been, you know, uh, a while. And I've been in this, and I'm trying to go to school. And a couple of the other guys did the same thing. And... Actually, it was a very somber thing because Jimmy died of an overdose. Janis Joplin, somebody else I knew well, died of an overdose. Our only guitarist wound up dying of an overdose. It was uh, uh, a heck of a time, and it just, you know, the the glittery life just didn't glitter as much. And I got a full fellowship to Columbia to go get my doctorate, and I said, I think I think I'm gonna. I've done enough of this. It's been great. Uh, and there's been some real heartbreak to it, too, and yeah. time to move on. So uh, I went back to Columbia, and I got my doctorate. Sounds like a a pretty good choice. What did your folks think while you were doing Shanana? They were at every single gig. Oh. My father in his jacket and tie with all these strung-out hippies. It was great. Oh, wow. Well, you were probably kind of playing his music, right? No, no. It, it, it actually, much earlier than him. To him, the '50s music was uh, was uh, rock and roll noise. But they loved it. They loved the whole thing. I many years after they died, uh, my brother showed me that there was a gorgeous photography book, a coffee table book, by a wonderful photographer, and it was the um, it was about the Fillmore East, which was a great rock and roll palace of uh, New York and. Uh, um, East Village, and we would play there regularly, and it was it's like the best place in, in the country to play. And one time I sang there, and um, National Educational Television, uh, you know, Channel 13 or whatever it is, uh, did a great taping of us. And this woman took beautiful pictures, and there's me doing my song. And then my brother shows me on the other side of the page, it was a two-page thing, there is my mother and father. I'd never seen these photographs before. And and my brother, standing there in the audience, clear as day, big as life, watching me. And uh, it just brought it all back to me. It was just such such a wonderful time. My parents adored it, and, and my brother did such a great job inventing us. Amazing. Well, I hope that you are um, taking steps to record your memories, I assume, for you know for your kids. And it sounds like an, a, a fascinating time growing up and, and such a diverse amount of you know things that you got into but have you ever gone into um genealogy at all or your family history or no but it sounds like a great idea I've, oh, it's been one of the many many things that i've always said i want to do and then i didn't have time to you know yeah yeah because i'd have no idea past i don't have a grandparent that was born in in america oh and uh, I have very little notion as to exactly where people came from. I mean, I know what the stories were, but mm-hmm. it just didn't seem important now that they were here and all alive. My great-grandmother, I know, was born somewhere in Eastern Europe and uh, was an indentured servant or something and finally got to this country. And then she was taking money back for uh, dowries in Poland or White Russia in her 70s. I guess you're smuggling the money between you and me. And, um, you know, there, there would be uh, uh, Polish or Jewish or Italian or whatever help societies here that they would collect money to raise for dowries for the girls, and then they'd bring the girls here, I guess. And she had um, dresses with many, many petticoats, and in the petticoats there were pockets, and she would put the money. Mm-hmm. I guess she was smuggling the money back there, and then she would deliver the money, and they would have their dowries. And she got caught by the Nazis. Oh, my gosh. In her 70s, she uh, escaped from them. She went either with the partisans or something. She wound up walking from somewhere in Central Europe all the way down, up, and then down to Stockholm. Oh, now my Now in her late 70s, where she talked her way on to a freighter. And they took her to New York. And my parents thought that she had died years and years ago. One day she shows up at their, uh, their door. So, I mean, I would love, that's all I really know about her. 
oh, but that's such key stuff. You got to write, you know, like you say, you got to document that, write that down now while you're thinking about it, add to it. You know, I can kind of verify that uh, whole story of the, the petticoats because my grandmother, same thing. Uh, well, excuse me, my great grandmother, the story from my grandmother was that great grandma had, she had sent her husband over and she had a little four year old back in, in Germany. And then she found out she was pregnant. And so she was a seamstress was the, was the story and that she had sold everything, converted into gold and sewn it into her petticoats. And then gone, you know, because on the ship, they were just terrified to have any kind of luggage or baggage or anything that would be picked up and walked away from somebody else. So (laughs) sounds like the women had a whole courier service going on back then. That's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I hope that you'll kind of stay with your interests there. I think the thing is that with genealogy, the same with some of these forensic sciences that we're hearing about, things have really moved forward so quickly and information is getting shared. And, uh, you no longer have to be retired to get somewhere because it doesn't take as long as it used to, which is a good thing, you know? So fantastic. Well, Dr. Robert Leonard, I really appreciate it. And I hope that when we get into our um, our culinary explorations into family history, you'll come back because I bet you have some ideas for us. I'll be happy. And anytime you have any language problem, any question, just uh, give me a holler. Oh, wonderful. Thank you so much. Take care. Nice to talk to you. Well, I hope that you have enjoyed this conversation with Dr. Leonard as much as I enjoyed doing it. Thank you so much to Robert Leonard for taking the time out of his very busy schedule. He travels all over the country, assisting the FBI and testifying in criminal cases, as well as his work at Hofstra University. And uh, I really appreciate him taking time out to help those of us in the world of genealogy incorporate some of his terrific strategies. He's mentioned lots of things here. Weren't you surprised to hear that he was an original member of Sha Na Na? <laughs> well, I've got lots of great additional information, links, all kinds of things in the show notes. Don't miss the show notes. Uh, they are packed full of great, fun information, usable information. Um, I've listed some of those strategies he's mentioned, got some links for you to the BBC Voices that he referred to, and of course, Google Scholar search, as well as some real fun stuff on Sha Na Na. Again, go to genealogygems.com, click on the podcast link in the left-hand menu, navigate your way, clicking the links to episode number 90. That'll take you to the show notes. You'll find everything listed there. And if you put to use some of these techniques that he talked about and make some interesting discoveries, be sure and drop me a line at genealogygemspodcast at gmail.com. Let me know about it. would love to hear. would love to share it on the show. You know, we just have to keep thinking outside the box, don't we? And if we think if we're all kind of sharing some of those gems that we find, it will inspire us and give us new ideas and new ways to find them for ourselves. Before we wrap up this 90th episode of the Genealogy Gems podcast, I am really excited to announce that we will be presenting the podcast live at the Southern California Genealogy Society Jamboree being held at the Burbank Airport Marriott Hotel on Saturday, June 12th, 2010 at 1 o'clock p.m. in the pavilion there at the convention center. My special guests on this live episode that we'll be presenting will be Maureen Taylor, the photo detective. You can get the dish on her new Civil War photography book, The Last Muster. We're going to have Suzanne Russo-Adams of Ancestry.com. She is fresh back from doing her research for the popular new TV series, Who Do You Think You Are? And Chris Haley, genealogist, artist, the nephew of Alex Haley. He will be there the day after his big banquet presentation doing a candid interview with me, and I'm really looking forward to that. Maybe we can get him to sing. Wouldn't that be great? I love doing the live show. My daughter Lacey will be there orchestrating things once again as stage manager, and we've got some terrific prizes to give away to lucky audience members throughout the show. So if you are going to be at Jamboree, and I hope you are because it is a blast, grab your lunch and head to the pavilion to be part of the live audience again on Saturday, June 12th, 
2010 at 1 o'clock p.m. For more information on the Jamboree and the live podcast, head on over to the Southern California Genealogy Jamboree blog at genealogyjamboree.blogspot.com. And of course, I'll also be there teaching several classes on Friday at three o'clock. I'll be teaching what you must know to save your research from destruction. On Saturday, right before the live show, I'll be participating in the Blogger Summit Part 2. I'll be there along with uh, Shelley Dardashti, Catherine Doyle, Thomas McKenty, and Craig Manson. Great lineup. And then, of course, at 1 o'clock, the live podcast in the Pavilion on Saturday. Later that day at 3.30, I'll be teaching Google a gold mine of genealogy gems. And on Sunday, 8.30 in the morning, you'll be tapping into your inner private eye, seven strategies you need to find living relatives. And as you know, I cover that topic in an article in the July 2000 issue of Family Tree Magazine. So it's kind of a companion to that. And Lacey and I will be there of course, at the Genealogy Gems podcast booth in the exhibit hall. It's booth 116 on the left-hand wall as you enter the exhibit hall. So come on over and say hi. I hope to see lots of you there. And just to emphasize, this live podcast that we're going to be doing on Saturday, it's free. Uh, There's seating for about 300 people in there, and I guarantee it's going to fill up. So (laughs) I hope you arrive early. Come on in and enjoy the free show. It's a wonderful way to spend your lunchtime break and uh, rejuvenate and hear from some terrific genealogists. And finally, premium members, stay tuned for the next premium episode because it's going to feature additional tips from Dr. Leonard on applying the principles of forensic linguistics to your genealogy research. Our conversation ran a little bit long, and I didn't want to leave any of it out, so it didn't make this show, but I will have it for you in the next premium podcast episode, which is number 48. And if you have the Genealogy Gems podcast app on your iPhone, iTouch, or iPad, um, be sure and look for that bonus content, those little extras that we get to add to the app podcast feed. It's kind of one of the fun features of the app. And if you don't have one, but you'd like to get one, I'll have a link for you in the show notes for this episode number 90 that will take you directly to the Genealogy Gems podcast app in the iTunes app store. Well, that's a wrap. So thank you so much for listening, friend. I'll talk to you soon.